So is, is it a calculation? Is it just some description of what's going on? Or, or does it get us into a deeper understanding of really what's happening? Does it help us at all to, un, to understand how the universe is, is generated? Yeah, it, it does. In fact, it's, a very, it's very important for understanding why the universe is the way it is. You know, the universe is information. It's bits, mm -hmm. right? There are maybe 10 to the 120 bits in the universe. And these bits are flipping. So it's about not just bits, information on its own, it's about processing and transforming information. And these bits have flipped, you know, 10 to the 120 times. About 10 to the 123, if you really do the calculation right. <laughs> I can't believe you get it that precise, uh, but that's fantastic. So at, at bottom, well, yeah, I told you we know more about what's going on at the universe scale. <laughs> we know more about the Big Bang than we know about the origins right. of life, let's yeah. face it, right? So, <clears throat> so yeah, so, so the universe is computing. It's consists of bits of information. And as I said, this has been known for more than 100 years, that at bottom, you know, every atom, every elementary particle has bits of information. In, in fact, you now begin to talk about the universe basically as a computer, a computational universe. I mean, that, that I think you would say, is, is the prime characteristic of the universe. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in fact, and, and ironically, I mean, even though maybe I'm, I'm guilty of being one of the first people really to take this seriously, this has been known for a long time. You know, the people who figured out that everything registers bits of information yeah. were, you know, James Clerk Maxwell, Ludwig yeah. Boltzmann, Josiah Willard Gibbs. This was in the end of the 19th St century. Statistical mechanics before quantum mechanics even. Yeah, even prior to quantum mechanics, mm. right? And then a uh, hundred years ago when quantum mechanics showed up, mm -hmm. you know, Max Planck's first paper about quantum mechanics in 1900 was to show that quantum mechanics helped solve this problem of making information finite. Mm. Prior to quantum mechanics, you know, which is the theory of nature that describes how things behave at their most fundamental level, right. then people knew that everything had information associated with it, but they didn't know if it was finite. They felt, oh, if I kept looking closer, I'd find more and more bits of information, I look even closer. Still, there's right, more right, and more right, information. Right, right, I, right. I could keep on looking to ever smaller scales right, right. and I, still more information would be revealed. But what quantum mechanics tells you and as Planck showed, in, again, the very first paper on quantum mechanics, is if you look to a certain degree of closeness, then that's it. There aren't any more bits. You look at the proton, you get down to where it is, what its spin is, that's it. There isn't any more information that's there. So that's really fundamental. That's fundamental. That's quantum mechanics, if you like. To my mind, the major role that quantum mechanics plays in our universe is to make information finite, to make the universe uh -huh. digital. Uh -huh. And, and that's, of course, why, you know, quantum mechanics is what makes chemistry finite. There's a certain number of chemical combinations, sure. right? Certain number of different atoms and molecules. That work and others don't. Yeah. <laughs> it makes, so it makes nature digital, right? It makes our DNA digital, that yeah. we can have two bits per base pair. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So quantum, the role that quantum mechanics plays, this fundamental role, is to make nature digital. Uh -huh. But we have this digital nature, which we've known for 100 years since Planck, right? And we've known ever since Maxwell and Boltzmann, we've known for 150 years that whenever you know, two atoms or elementary particles collide, their bits flip, right? right, right. right? You know, I take these two protons, <laughs> come in, ba-dang, right? Yeah. Their bits flip when they bounce off of each other. At bottom, the universe is processing information. It's computing. So it, the funny thing is, you know, when I go around like giving talks about, say, the universe is a giant computer, it sounds like some bizarre postmodern <laughs> yeah, 21st right, right, century right. thing. But in fact, it's actually a 19th century yeah. notion that the universe is at bottom processing information. But now, and this is the great thing about it, now that we're more savvy about what computers are and what they can do, now we, that we know the universe is computing, now we can figure out stuff about the universe that we couldn't have figured out by knowing that it's computing. For example? Well, for example, one of the things that I do is, this, is we figured out uh, uh, here in this laboratory actually how to take atoms and molecules and make them into computers themselves, computers that we can use. Right, you know, uh, spin of the proton, spin up as zero, spin down as one. Here's another proton, spin up zero, spin down one. We take them and say, I flip this proton if and only if this one's like this. We do a logical operation on these two protons, or on five protons, or 10 protons. We can build little computers where each atom stores a bit. These, these quantum computers have you know, one atom, one bit, to <laughs> paraphrase the Supreme Court. Right. Uh, so, so one thing that we can get out of this is that we can, we can use the fact that the universe is computing to build our own computers. In fact, that's why we can build quantum computers, is because the universe is already computing. Wow. We're effectively, you know, when we build these quantum computers, 
we're hacking into the universe's <laughs> computation, right? <laughs> we're going to hack into the universe and get it to perform a computation that we want it to do, right? Not just the one that it's already doing on its own. So that's one consequence, is that this kind of neat technological consequence is we can build these computers where we store one atom on a bit. But the most important consequence is if the universe as a whole is computing, it explains something that the laws of physics on their own do not explain. Or if I were that matter, the laws of chemistry. The fact that the universe is computing explains why it's complex. Now, the laws of physics on their own are simple. Right? You can see them written down on the back of a t-shirt. Go outside here at MIT, yeah. you'll find several people, even size petite, right? Mm -hmm. And the initial state of the universe at the Big Bang was also extremely simple. Almost no bits of information in there, a few hundred bits in the whole laws of physics and the initial state of the universe. And in fact, if there's only one choice for the laws of physics and one choice for the initial state of the universe, then there's no bits there, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very information-free. So then where the heck did all this stuff come from? You know, where did human beings, societies, you know, quantum computers, ordinary computers, uh, where did all this complexity come from? And that is explained by the fact that the universe is computing. Because if you take something, even something very simple, like a universe, and you start it off computing, processing information, trying out different combinations of the way you can process information, then you can prove mathematically that such a system will necessarily generate complexity. It will necessarily generate structures that can reproduce themselves, like simple molecules that can reproduce themselves via chemical reactions. And then those simple molecules that can reproduce themselves via chemical reactions, they necessarily, because they're computing, have to give rise to more complex things like life, organisms that reproduce themselves. And things like bacteria that reproduce themselves with variation they necessarily must eventually give rise to things like you know, mammals and human beings. And human mm -hmm. beings, unfortunately, or fortunately, necessarily give rise to <laughs> things like you know, computers and television societies and unfortunate things like wars and economies. And then things like wars and economies and human societies, they give rise to, well, we don't know what's mm -hmm. going to happen, right? But it's going to give rise to something interesting. Um, I once saw a James Brown concert, and people asked James Brown, he said, James, what are you going to play next? And he said, I don't know, but whatever it is, it's got to be funky. <laughs> well, whatever's going to happen next has got to be funky. <laughs>